So you know why you're here. You're here to have this discussion about Fresno small business capital flows and gap analysis. Um, and uh, just a little bit of background about the study. Uh, it was birthed from Fresno Drive's Betting Big initiative. Uh, and if you don't know about Fresno Drive, you should go learn about it, fresnodrive.org. Um, and the Betting Big initiative is really centered around creating opportunity and capacity for small businesses, small entrepreneurs of color. And it's being led by the Fresno Metro Black Chamber of Commerce. So we're really happy to have this discussion today. It's going to be led by Matt Brewster, who is with P2 Advisors. Uh, Matt conducted the study. Uh, and so we're super excited to dig into that today and hear about what he found out about what small entrepreneurs of color, small businesses of colors need in terms of capital flows. So we're excited about that. Um, I'm going to use my notes here to make sure that I thank everybody. We want to first uh, thank Matt, of course, with P2 Advisors, and also Jason Friedman with J uh, Friedman and Associates, who's going to be online with us today and who will be facilitating the panel. Um, also want to thank Access Plus Capital um, for jointly sponsoring this uh, study with us and also for jointly sponsoring this convening with us today. Um, and uh, all of that is being done with support from the Heron Foundation. I think there are other folks here who are involved with funding Fresno, which is a collaborative of community lenders. And so we are glad to welcome you here today uh, as well. Um, and also to thank JP Morgan Chase and also the James Irvine Foundation for their support of Drive and their support of this work. So again, welcome. We are so glad you're here and we can't wait to hear from Matt. So come on up. Good afternoon, everyone. How are you all doing? Thank you uh, to the Community Foundation first for hosting this forum um, and for motivating interest in the topic, um, access to capital for entrepreneurs is something that I personally care a lot about um, and we do a lot of work on. So always a pleasure to put minds together with people who are passionate about it, just like we are. Um, and I'll just uh, second what Heather said and thanking everyone who contributed to the project and, and made it possible. Um, there are several people in the room who participated in the interview program um, that helped inform some of the insights that I'll share with you and uh, appreciate you taking time out of your day to, to learn about what we found. So I'll just give you a, a little bit overview of how we're hoping to use the time and then I'll dive right in. So uh, we're gonna give you a little context on the project approach and the methodology. Um, then I'm gonna spend about 30 or so minutes walking you through the top line findings from our data analysis and conversations with stakeholders in the community. Um, we're gonna answer some questions you might have, clarifying questions, um, so save those towards the end of the presentation. And then we're gonna spend actually the bulk of the time, ideally in discussion with ecosystem leaders, um, practitioners on the ground doing the work, and then we're gonna break out and have discussions around the findings and, and really next steps too on, on where we go from here. So Heather shared good context on, on the project. Um, do want to acknowledge those on the right-hand side of the slide who directly participated in the interview program um, that informs some of the insights I'll share towards, towards the end of my presentation. Um, here's how we approached the project and you can see the specific questions that guided our research on the slide here, but I can sum it up uh, more succinctly. We really wanted to understand where capital was going to small businesses, where it wasn't going, the unmet demand for financing. And we wanted to understand why or why not and what we do about it. That's really the essence of the motivation of the project and the key questions we sought to answer. So to do that, we analyzed the lending 
data for small businesses across sectors, across types of lenders, banks, to CDFIs, to understand uh, who they were lending to uh, the best we could based on the data. Then we used some great survey data um, from the Federal Reserve, analyzed it in a real granular way to get a good estimate of deals that aren't being done, right? Because the lending data only shows you by definition those loans that were made. What about the ones that weren't made? And then data can only get you so far in our experience doing this work across the country. You really need to talk to local practitioners about, again, the why and understanding what you see in, in the data. So that was the third and, and critical um, work stream that we engaged in. So I'll dive in. And first, I want to just level set on definitions, like what we're talking about, what we really dug into. And the key things to call out are the types of lending that we looked at, and then also want to just upfront share the comparable markets that we used in our analysis. So we looked at um, all the granular data that's available on small business lending. That includes bank lending, which you'll see in a second is most of the lending by dollar and number of loans. And more specifically, that is banks with uh, over a billion in assets. Sounds like a lot. That's actually not. That's most banks. Um, and that's from the FFIEC, um, who is the one that oversees CRA regulation that requires that reporting. On the S Small Business Administration side, we looked at the flagship program for the Small Business Administration, the 7A program, which is really a loan guarantee program that is meant to increase access to capital for small businesses, in short. Um, that's mostly banks who are participating in that program. So it's really important to note up front, SBA lending is a subset of primarily bank lending. There are other lenders doing SBA loans, but it's over 95% banks, but important to look at given its, its core mission of increasing access to capital for small businesses. And then lastly, we have CDFI small business lending. Um, I'm going to assume some general familiarity with what CDFIs are. They're treasury certified specialized financing institutions with uh, focus on low income or other underserved populations. And, and that data comes from the CDFI fund. On the comparable markets, we, in our experience, have found it's really important not just to look at the rate of lending in a market relative to the national average, although it's helpful, and you'll see we, we do that in our analysis. It's really important to compare apples to apples. You really have to find other regions or communities that are similar in different ways to the region you're studying to truly benchmark performance. So what we did is we looked at comparable size, comparable economic conditions, comparable demographics, and comparable industry mix. And you can see the four that we identified are uh, Sacramento, Albuquerque, Buffalo, and Memphis. Now, I'm going to use those cities when I reference them, um, but we looked at the county surrounding. You know, our overall focus was on Fresno County, so the county surrounding the, the, the metro. So let's dive in. This is the top line of what we found. This is a snapshot of small business lending in, in Fresno County. And overall, there's about 775 million in small business loans annually in Fresno County. And compared to national averages and other markets, bank lending and SBA lending is lower. And CDFI lending is higher. Really important to note, though, if you look at the graphs on the right that looks at loan count and total loan dollars, the CDFI portion is pretty small at the bottom, right? Um, much less than 1% of the total lending represented here. I do just want to caveat that this isn't all the small business lending in Fresno County, inevitably. There isn't good data on financial technology firms lending to businesses anywhere in the United States, including, including Fresno County. There are uh, gaps related to smaller banks and credit unions that aren't reflected here. So this is a pretty good approximation of the total market, but not exactly. Just want to be clear about that. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go through bank lending, SBA lending, CDFI lending. I'm just going to call out the salient trends that, that we found. Um, then we're going to talk about the unmet financing demand and some of the themes that, that we heard from, from stakeholders. So first, 
not in a comparative sense, just an absolute sense. What does bank lending look like in Fresno County to small businesses? Across all these, we looked at like a five-year period to try to smooth things out to really get a sense of the trend over the long term. And you can see that uh, banks make about 17,000 loans, totaling over $3.5 billion to small businesses um, annually in, in Fresno County. One really important footnote on that number is that um, credit card lending counts as loans to small businesses. So just in terms of understanding what is really underneath that and why there are so many loans and why the average loan amount is a little bit lower than, than you might otherwise expect. It includes a lot of different types of, of lending. In terms of the trend over time, uh, you can see that bank lending to small businesses has increased in recent years and actually jumped in 2020. And at first you might say, that's surprising. That was COVID, right? Um, but what's underneath that, if you peel back the onion, is the Paycheck Protection Program. So a lot of lending happened from that. We're going to talk about PPP in a few slides head on, um, but that is why you saw a jump in, in 2020. Um, so we looked at the trend before that. So what, is, what does it look like pre-COVID? There's still, I would say, in an absolute sense, healthy growth, 5% annualized growth in small business lending in, in Fresno County. Uh, lastly, I'll just highlight uh, LMI lending. So the bank lending data doesn't allow us to look at who exactly got a loan, but it allows us to look at where that business is that got the loan. And we can cross-reference and say, was that business located or is that business located in a low to moderate income area? And you can see here that pretty consistently, about 27% of bank loans went to LMI areas. So hopefully that gives you a good snapshot, but it probably underscores the importance of so what, right? How does that compare, right? How do we think about that? So let's look at it on a comparative basis to national average and the, and the comparable markets. And here is where you can see on the bank side, the headline that I shared earlier, which is that although there's growth, although there's a lot of lending, the rate of lending on a per capita basis compared to the national average and comparable markets is on the lower end. Um, by loan count, number of loans per resident, and by total loan dollars. And you'll see this as a theme throughout the findings, but this really underscores the importance of the comparable markets, right? Because all these comparable markets are lower than the U.S. average. And that just underscores the importance of finding apples to apples markets that have similar economic conditions, similar size of businesses, similar industry mix, et cetera. So next we can look at loan size and do the same comparison. And you can see that you know, Fresno Bank small business loans tend to be much smaller than national averages. Again, here, it's important to compare to the other markets. All of them are much smaller, and that's a reflection of smaller businesses, smaller markets. But you can see it's even more so for Fresno than the other markets, 91% so and change of small business loans were less than $100,000. And the only market where there are smaller loans was Sacramento, just down the road. In terms of LMI lending, 27% in Fresno County, uh, how does that compare? And you can see that Fresno is fourth among comparable markets in terms of the rate of lending to LMI areas. It's very imprecise in terms of actually who's receiving that, that capital, um, but compared to these markets, you would expect that to be higher we included the U.S. average here, but I would really not index too much on it. You might want to say, oh, Fresno is higher than the national average. However, if you compare moderate income areas to the national average, um, it's an unfair comparison, right? There are more low income areas in, in Fresno than there are the national average. So the headline is that um, you would want this to be higher if you care about LMI area lending. So that's bank lending. Now we're going to talk about SBA lending. And again, this is kind of a, a subset of bank lending, I would say, but we have some good data on it. And it's a program meant to increase access to capital for, for smaller businesses. So it's important that we look at head, head on. Um, here you can see much smaller in scale. So it's uh, 125 or so loans on average a year. And the trend jumps out, right? It's, it's downward. Now, here too, 2020 is anomalous related to COVID and to PPP. Uh, PPP 
is an SBA program, but it's not a 7A program. So it's not in here. So a lot of the lenders who are making 7A loans, they were busy making the PPP loans that you saw in the bank data. So we, you kind of got to take with a grain of salt that. But again, if we reel back time and say, okay, what did it look like 2016 to 2019? There was a steady decline, almost a double digit decline in SBA 7A lending in Fresno County. Um, and I will say and acknowledge that that is a trend that's happening nationally, a decline or stagnation in, in SBA 7A lending and their efforts to, to try to increase that lending. It's a much longer story there to be told, but I'll, I'll leave it there for now. So if we compare similarly, um, you see basically the same result as you do on bank lending, which you would expect. Um, if you look at loans per capita, Fresno's below national average by about 25%, and again, fourth in terms of comparable markets. One little bright spot, though, is that in terms of loan dollars, Fresno's second among comparable markets. And that's kind of a mixed bag, depending on how you look at the world. The reason that is, is because Fresno's SBA loans are much larger than the national average in comparable markets at 600000 and change. So if you really care about lending to very small or micro businesses defined as 10 employees or fewer, um, pick your definition, then uh, it isn't as good of a statistic, although it might look good in terms of dollars deployed. So now let's look at PPP. We saw how that kind of uh, impacted the numbers in 2020. So we wanted to look at uh, access to PPP loans. And uh, again, I'll assume some familiarity with the program, but just real quick, high level. Uh, this was a COVID relief program that was administered from April 2020 to March 2021. Uh, absolutely massive in scale, over $750 billion nationally. And these were essentially forgivable loans. It's a loan that turned into a grant if you play by the rules. And depending on who you asked, the rules were relatively straightforward and easy, easy to follow. Um, so it was a big opportunity, a once in a generation opportunity to get access to relief capital. So really important to think about um, the access on a relative basis among Fresno small businesses. Um, they accessed about 600 million in PPP, which sounds like a great number, but if you compare it, Fresno actually is at the bottom of the graph you see there in terms of PPP lending per capita. It's the same if you look at on a per enterprise basis and less than the US total. And I'll say just two quick things about that. And I think we'll get more into it when we look at some of the uh, findings and observations from a lot of you in the interview program. Uh, nationally, places that had difficulty getting small business access was related to documentation and awareness are the two biggest things that jumped out. Um, you had to have documentation on payroll. You have to be quote unquote above board and, and be participating formally in the economy. And you had to be aware of the program and some of the nuances of it. So now let's talk about CDFI lending. Um, again, a real small portion of the overall lending picture in Fresno County, but a really, really important one, particularly in terms of the communities that Heather highlighted, the Fresno Drive, and a lot of you are, are focused on. Here, the data is... Uh, smaller in terms of the data set. So the trends are a little choppier, you can see. Um, but overall, small business lending from CDFIs in Fresno County, it's about 81 loans a year, about 5 million in lending annually. You see the trend has been pretty inconsistent. There's a, a jump in number of loans made in 2016. There's a pretty big jump in terms of loan dollars deployed in 2017. Um, pretty anomalous. There's a couple really large loans um, as CDFIs go, $1.7 million loans. And this is anonymized data too, so we can't tell. We can tell which banks are making the loans. We can tell which ones are making the SBA loans. We can't tell which CDFIs. I, I'm sure um, many of you could probably guess um, who's who if you saw the data, um, but we don't have uh, direct visibility into that. We do see that there are 11 active CDFIs. Um, and interestingly, 94% of the loans by count came from just two CDFIs. And when we say active CDFIs, that's CDFIs that made a loan in the market, not necessarily located here, right? But they made a loan to a small business located in Fresno County. 
So how does CDFI lending compare? Again, it's small in an absolute sense, but this was a nice bright spot compared to national averages and to comparable markets. Um, Fresno County ranks second among comparable markets um, and is, is higher than the national average by, by a good degree, measured both by number of loans and the loan dollars. So that's encouraging. Um, again, want to go back to still a very small absolute number. Um, and if you're focused on Ephemerusical or smaller businesses, it's important to focus on growing this, but um, it's encouraging nonetheless. And lastly, on, on loan data, while we don't have good information on who's actually getting the loan from, from banks, which in our view should change, we should have visibility into that. That's a, another discussion. Uh, but the CDFI fund uh, does collect data from CDFIs on who actually is getting the loan. Not the area and cross-referencing with LMI areas, but actually who's getting the loan. So we can see the rate of lending to racial and ethnic minorities, and we can see the rate of lending to business owners who are very low income or low income. And you can see nationally, CDFIs do a good job of reaching both of these populations. But Fresno, small, small business lending by CDFIs, is far better. 75% um, of loans by CDFIs to small businesses went to racial and ethnic minorities compared to about 58% nationally. And it was more than the comparable markets. And again, we chose comparable markets that had similar demographics. So in the context of uh, the motivation for this study, that's great news, right? Um, CDFI lending is above comparable markets and national averages, and they're reaching the target population at a greater rate. The same is true on the rate of lending to LMI folks. Um, you can see there's a greater rate of lending to very low and low income, um, second to only Sacramento. And I'm sorry, that's the second time I had to say this in this conversation. So enough about the loans that have been made. What about the loans that are not getting done? Uh, this is a busy slide, so I'm just going to give you the headline um, and share a little bit about the methodology. Uh, we've developed a pretty neat way to estimate the unmet financing demand. This has been kind of a gap in the field. Everyone looks at loans being done and draws comparisons, and, and we see value in that. Um, but it's kind of like the tip of the iceberg. Like What we're really trying to solve for a lot of times is getting those who don't have access, access. So how many people don't have access and how much demand is there from them? Overall, we found an estimated $3 billion annually in unmet financing demand from small businesses in Fresno County, which is kind of like an eye-popping number. And about $1.3 billion of that is unmet demand from applications. So this is small businesses who applied for a loan, got completely denied, got none of what they requested, or they only got some of what they requested, right? So there was a, what we call financing shortfall. Um, so that's really just taking the businesses in the market, the rate at which they apply for financing, how much they sought, how much they received, you know, the kind of first four columns there, that gets you to like the dark green part of the pie chart on the right, the unmet demand for applications. And then we have a admittedly bit more squishy, but really important number, um, something we call latent demand for financing. So there are businesses that didn't apply for financing, but we have reasons why. And some of them indicate to us that it's important to pay attention to that number as well. Um, so you can see in this second to the right column, the reason they didn't apply. And we've grayed out the reasons that we think are not material to, to look at, but those who indicated that they were discouraged in their search for financing, they found the cost of capital was too high, or they found the search too difficult. To us, that indicates there's likely some demand there, right? So let's take those people, assume that if they were to apply, they would apply the same amount on average as the other businesses. And that gets us the latent demand number in the light green uh, on the right. So you can haircut that in your mind extent you'd like, given there's not direct um, indication there of how much they might need, but uh, it's a good number to focus on and think about how you reduce those numbers in terms of discouragement, cost of capital, and people finding the search difficult. 
if you peel back the onion a bit more for really thinking about access to capital for entrepreneurs of color, we do have that micro data available. So we can say, what do these things look like for those business owners? And I won't look at every stat. Um, you can see it on the screen and, and peruse it at, at your interest. But uh, in summary, I would say entrepreneurs of color apply for financing at greater rates to start. So they're seeking capital at a greater rate. They receive less of the financing that they apply for on average across the board. And they have much greater rates of latent demand, right? So cost capital is too high, search is difficult, et cetera. So this is, it's good rich data behind anecdotally um, what we heard a lot from stakeholders on the ground. And what that results in is the unmet demand per firm, right? So you kind of normalize it to the uh, number of businesses is about 30 to 44% higher for entrepreneurs of color than it is for the average small business owner or the white owned small business. So enough data. Um, that's what we found. And when we were done with that, we wanted to talk to people in the field actually supporting small businesses, either with financing or with technical assistance and education, um, who got a sense of these dynamics on the ground. And we asked a set of questions that were focused on understanding what the barriers were to their clients accessing financing, what are the gaps in the ecosystem, and then we asked about potential solutions, like what can we do about it? So this is the answering the why not um, in terms of the lending, and then we'll look at what potential solutions could be. And hopefully this is good food for thought going into the good discussion in a, in a few minutes. So the most salient theme we heard was poor financial health and readiness of uh, would-be borrowers or, or applicants for financing, um, particularly uh, among smaller businesses, micro businesses, and entrepreneurs of color. And this is what we see in the data nationally. It all goes all the way back to the racial wealth gap at the end of the day, if you really peel it back. Um, there are a couple of unique things though to, to Fresno County in our view that I think are important to note. One is the rate at which businesses didn't have proper record keeping um, and didn't formally participate in the economy. So no payroll records or cash based, no bookkeeping, some of them not even a bank account. And that really limits the ability even of the CDFIs sometimes to work with them, to lend to them. If they can't really see, if the, the business can't even uh, communicate what the business's performance is, it's really hard for um, financing institutions to, to understand the condition of the business. Um, and then to the extent there was data, a lot of, uh, practitioners noted that there are a lot of businesses that are unprofitable, that they're not cash flow and they're losing money month over month. And again, even the most flexible lenders have to take a hard look at that and assess whether that business could truly repay a loan. So that was another big barrier that was called out, uh, low personal credit, uh, is another one. Um, and nationally, um, we see pretty stark differences along uh, racial ethnic lines there. Entrepreneurs of color tend to have lower personal and business credit scores. Um, so that really underpins that. And of course, COVID exacerbated all of these factors. Um, the other thing that came up a lot, also more prominent in Fresno County than other places we've done this work is language and culture barriers that prevent access. And underpinning that are a couple different forces. Some noted that the staff at financing institutions weren't uh, bilingual, weren't culturally competent to engage with these entrepreneurs. Um, so that's on the provider side. And then on the small business side, there were observations about a lack of trust in engaging in some of the financing institutions. Um, so there's, there are different things really underneath that. Uh, there's also a lot of discussion of the financing solutions that are really available to businesses that aren't quote unquote, traditionally bankable. Um, you know, CDFIs in many ways have missions to fill gaps that the banks leave behind and make riskier loans and are more character based in their, in their lending. Um, but even CDFIs in Fresno County and elsewhere, um, tend to offer a, a narrow set of financing solutions. It's typically a term loan. Um, and a lot of businesses need 
equity-like capital that's more patient in nature. They might need a working capital solution that's not like a higher interest credit card or a predatory loan from a, a fintech. And there was just an observation on the practitioner side and we have a small businesses that there could be more solutions. And then lastly, lack of awareness of a lot of the CDFI and other mission-driven financing institutions out there. There was just a general sentiment that the that ecosystem is serving kind of a, a small subset of the overall population that's represented on that massive, on that financing demand chart. So what do folks think that we should do about it? Um, that's really the focus of this next slide. You know, what are the opportunities and, and solutions to that? Uh, we heard a lot about marketing nonprofit mission-driven financing institutions, AKA CDFIs, but others as well, just to make small businesses and those that uh, engage with small businesses aware of the offerings that they have. And there are a bunch of different ways to approach this. And there's some really interesting green shoots efforts going on right now. A lot of people mentioned funding Fresno. Um, a lot of people said it's early days. We're not sure exactly how that's going to work out, but it's, there's a lot of promise. And, and that's one initiative that is focused on driving awareness. Um, and there's also a little bit of confusion of how that relates to the SBA's lender match tool. Um, so there's kind of an opportunity there to um, figure out lanes, get the word out, um, and get people utilizing those tool tools. Others mentioned uh, institutionalizing bank to CDFI referrals. Um, and we've seen a lot of great success in other places with this. The rate at which banks say, sorry, we can't serve you, have a wonderful day, and don't send them somewhere where they might be able to get access is unfortunately much higher than we believe it, it should be. And a lot of people share that sentiment when we talk to them. The next big theme was around uh, establishing and or growing to the extent it already exists culture responsive entrepreneurial education, training, and technical assistance. And this is really one answer to the financial health and readiness theme we saw in the challenges, right? Having TIA providers, educational programs that prepare businesses to access financing, whether it be from a CDFI bank or, or otherwise. The other big theme was around designing or expanding innovative financing solutions that better need, meet the needs of those where there's a lot of unmet financing demand and the numbers, uh, entrepreneurs of color, really small businesses. In addition to just growing the ecosystem of CDFI work that already exists, a number of specific things were called out that we captured here. Credit building loan products, small dollar loans to help folks build their credit to then graduate to larger loans, more flexible debt solutions uh, for working capital. So not just a, a five-year term loan, but what about like a line of credit, for example? And then patient equity or equity-like capital, you know, a business that's just starting up and needs money to invest in its growth might not be able to pay back a loan um, right away. It's just square peg in a, in a round hole. And then folks also mentioned sector-specific products and solutions, just given the unique nature of the Fresno economy. And um, one bright spot, for example, that's been successful there in the CD5 space is actually an opportunity fund as a trucking loan program. Like th that's specific, like only for truckers. And they've had great success in Fresno County specifically because they tailored a product to um, a specific growing segment where there's a lot of underserved entrepreneurs. And then lastly, I think supporting all the above, funding is required to grow this ecosystem, um, to support the TA, to support the capital access, um, and funding that supports all components, the, the loan capital, the operating capital, capacity building, et cetera. So I hope that gives you all a good sense of what we found in our analysis and then you know, anecdotally what a lot of local stakeholders uh, interpreted uh, when they looked at those numbers and thought about potential solutions. The last thing I'll share quick is we heard a lot about CDFI lending. It was a a really important theme of what we looked into. It came up a lot in the discussions organically. And it got us thinking about a back of the envelope, what would it look like to scale CDFI lending in Fresno County? If you take the unmet financing demand that's disproportionately sits with entrepreneurs of color and you look at who's serving them well, CDFIs, you know, 75% of Fresno County CDFI loans going to entrepreneurs of color seems to be an obvious solution there. But as I mentioned in the beginning, $5 million a year is actually a really small absolute number. 
might be better than some other places we compare it to, but um, it's, it's quite small. So what would it look like if that grew to 5% of the overall lending that we had in this analysis? Um, it would be six times what it is today, um, and it would be about $40 million a year. And hopefully this gives just an illustration of what one element of success could look like to close the gap in access to capital for entrepreneurs of color and other underserved businesses. So with that, um, we're going to transition into Q and a look forward to your questions, um, and to answering them. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, yeah. Matt has definitely given us a gift um, with his study, research, and analysis. It gives us a lot to chew on, think about, um, and work collaboratively on, you know, uh, the opportunities here that we have. Um, for the next 15 minutes, this is a Q&A, so we want your questions. We will also be taking questions from Zoom, and I'll pass around the mic. So um, I'll take the first question. Did your data include uh, conventional microloans by the banks, you know, the credit score products? Uh, were you able to get that from the banks? All the bank lending is in, in the data set, and that's why the average loan amount in the bank data is relatively low compared to like... You said it isn't in there? It is included. Yeah, all bank loans made by those included in the data set that are of banks that are over a billion in assets. Those are the only ones who are required. To An observation, too, is that I think that the 7A lending went down, probably continued because Dorothy Thomas retired. <laughs> so <laughs> she was a big deal in that. <laughs> and they had to move back to him. Thank you. And I appreciate you not calling out the 504 omission. <laughs> I'll get you later. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. Actually, we'll do we'll do this. If, let's let's do a line, so I'm not running around the room too much. Um, so, if folks want a question, well, we, in the mic, not for the room, but for Zoom. Well, my question, I'm just curious. Um, why was Erie and Buffalo in the set? I mean, it's half the population, and what was the driver to include that? Yeah, we looked at industry mix and demographics um, and economic conditions. And, and there we looked at the poverty rate and unemployment rate. I think those were the main things, economic conditions and um, demographics that uh, cause us to chose that. It's interesting to see which ones, if you just run the numbers, pop up um, and skip food for thought. Do we have any questions on Zoom? There are some in the yes, chat. We we have one from uh, Jensen in uh, Vang, and I'm going to unmute, and you may ask your question. Um, thanks, thanks for the report. Very helpful and useful data. Can you share through the process of uh, gathering this report? Uh, share something unique that you've discovered in Fresno that are that is working that other regions aren't using or doing. Unique to Fresno in terms of what Fresno is doing. Um, a couple of things that jump out to me that are unique about Fresno, um, we're just in the themes we just talked about, uh, the rate at which businesses anecdotally are not participating formally in the economy, um, is much higher than we typically run into in other markets and CDFIs here, I think they can face a unique challenge with that, you know, even being as mission driven as they are if you don't have something to, to really look at to understand a business's fundamentals. I think it presents a, a challenge. Um, much of this is directly answering the question, but I will just share another unique thing in the data is that the, the rate of unmet financing demand um, from entrepreneurs of color is a proportion to general population, significantly higher in Fresno than other markets. Uh, we didn't 
you'll you remember compare to those other markets in the financing demand just because of the limitations of the data. But anytime we've done that deep analysis in another market, this is actually the greatest disproportionate demand from entrepreneurs of color that we've seen doing this work. And we've done it uh, about a dozen times. So that's a unique aspect as well. One more from Zoom. We have uh, Maria, and you can ask her a question now. Hi, thank you for sharing this really wonderful information. Um, it's very illuminating. My question was around um, any further analysis on the data around BIPOC people receiving less financing except Asian folks, and does this mirror, mirror national and other comparable uh, data that you saw? Um, yeah, we are able to see, and I, I can go back to it, um, so I know we went relatively quickly, um, the rate of application and unmet demand from, from entrepreneurs of color. Um, and we can drill down not completely into subgroups. So this, maybe this is part of your question. So we can look at white, Asian, Hispanic, and black community. We don't have, unfortunately, disaggregated data within the Asian community. Um, the very few times that we've been able to get that data in other places, you see pretty stark differences within that community, particularly the Southeast Asian community. And if you overlap the intersectionality of the immigrant community, there's a lot of need there, um, which I mentioned just because you called out the uh, accept Asian. I think there there is likely some need there within that subgroup and it, it warrants like further investigation. Does that answer the question? Um, feel free yes, to thank you. Follow. You've touched on exactly what I was wondering. Yeah, the disaggregated data. Um, yeah, so that that's helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. One more question from Zoom before we come back in the room. Okay, and then I have Emily up next. And you can ask your question. Okay, thank you so much. Really appreciate this great information. I was just curious, and apologies if I missed it, if you had already mentioned it, but where were SBA micro loans included in the data set? Was that within the CDFI lender um, subset, since those are different from 7As? Love the question. Great question. Um, they're represented in the CDFI data. Um, they're not in the SBA 7A data set. Um, SBA Community Advantage, which is a program within the SBA 7A program, is represented there, and some CDFIs participate in that. In short, the Community Advantage program is a sub sub program of 7A that's focused on working with organizations that serve economically disadvantaged businesses including a lot of nonprofit lenders who happen to be certified as, as CDFIs. Um, but the microloans is found in the CDFI data. We could pull the microloan data separately and analyze that, but it would be double counting directly a lot of the CDFI lending because most SBA micro lenders are CDFIs. Does that answer your question? Yes, that does. Thanks so much. Sure. Appreciate the question. Go on. Okay, hang on Zoom. I know we have more questions, but we're going to come back into the room and we'll be right back. Thank you so much, Matt, for the presentation. Um, I actually have a couple questions. Um, one is pertaining to the CDFIs, um, and they're doing immaculate work here in Fresno. Um, but I'm wondering why, um, you know, I've seen the 81 um, the 81, I think it was 81 applicants annually. Um, I'm wondering why um, that number is so low. Do you think it's because uh, folks don't know much about CDFIs or know that they're a resource in the community? Um, is there a lack of um, awareness? Um, what do you think? Great question. Um, I would say in general, and then I'll make some Fresno specific comments, um, anywhere we tend to do this work, it's a chicken or egg, right? Like, is it that people aren't aware or is it that the CDFIs aren't resourced enough to meet the demand, right? So it's kind of this like circular reference. And here we heard a lot about um, lack of awareness of CDFIs. And there's a relatively small community of organizations who serve small businesses that are referring to CDFIs and a limited reach in terms of 
CDFIs getting the word out about what they offer. And um, if you compare to the marketing that a lot of lenders do, the banks, um, a lot of the financial technology firms, digital marketing, online marketing, um, Wildstat, FinTechs spend about 30% of their revenue on marketing. Mm -hmm. So they're hitting these businesses over the head with ads mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for their offerings. Um, many view as, as predatory. Um, so I think that that's the first thing I would call out. The second is having the resources to meet that demand um, from a loan capital perspective, from an operating support perspective, and then also marketing, right? So that's where the circle starts to, to close, right? Um, if there's marketing, um, the CFIs could get access to marketing funding, then they can make businesses more aware of their offerings um, that are more attractive than a lot of the alternatives that they're seeing more prominently in the market. Thank you. Um, I also noticed that the data stops at 2017. Do you know why? I do know why. Um, the CDFI fund, um, as many of you probably know, has uh, administered a couple of really large relief programs to channel money to CDFIs, the Rapid Response Program, and now the Equitable Recovery Program that is about to, to be dispersed. And they've been busy with that, and they have paused on other activities like mm -hmm. updating their data. Um, so we're constrained in the, in the data for now. Okay, thank you so much. Good. Last Good. question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm inquisitive. Okay, last question. Um, so I work for Fresno Metro Black Chamber of Commerce and we do perform uh, technical assistance in helping to get entrepreneurs ready yeah. um, to be loan ready for these loans, grants, and, and et cetera. Um, I have been having a lot of issues with getting like a clear definition um, from banks um, about what makes a client applicable, what is financial health. Uh, it varies. Um, I get all sorts of answers, if not no answer at all. Yep. Have you um, ran into that issue as well or, or seen that? Did that come up in the data at all? Yeah, we observe this a lot. And I, I, I would candidly say it's not just banks. It's uh commonly uh, all financing institutions. And, and I don't know specifically the dynamics between technical assistance providers and CDFIs in the market, but in a lot of places, we see gaps in information, even within the mission-driven ecosystem yeah. of what it really takes to qualify for a loan. Um, so certainly with the banks, absolutely. But I think it is broader and more systemic. Uh, to me, one thing that jumps out is the importance of relationships. Um, a lot of times the credit policies and things that a financing institution, whether it be a bank or see if I can do evolve and change, they might launch a new product. They might be responding to economic conditions and changing their underwriting criteria. So the importance of really developing the relationship with those who are making the financing decisions is, is huge. Um, and that takes time. Um, and another thing we heard that was unique to Fresno, is there's been a lot of turnover at the banks too. Right. So you develop a relationship with a lender, you think you have a good sense of things and then your contact's gone, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so hopefully that gives a, a little insight into it. Thank you so, so much. Sure. Thanks for the question. Hi, Matt. This question is more about risk and appetite. And I'm wondering, just looking at um, small business loans and, and knowing the landscape of Fresno, what would you say is the, um, the ratio um, between small businesses and micro businesses? Does Fresno have more micro businesses and maybe that's a barrier or appetite or risk, you know, uh, element that banks and some CDFIs are not willing to deal with? In short, yes. Um, if we look at the data behind why the average loan amount across lender type is lower, um, we did peel back and say, okay, what is the comparable size of businesses by number of employees is what we have. We actually don't have revenue, unfortunately, not great data out there on that. There are more micro businesses, however you define it, fewer than 20, fewer than 10, fewer than five employees. And there are a number of things that that results in as it relates to risk appetite from lenders of any kind. Mm -hmm. um, actually, I'd say the first is not necessarily risk profile, it's size alone. It costs any lender about the same to underwrite 
a large loan versus a small loan. There's some variance. Um, so the unit economics of doing a loan for call it five thousand dollars a nano loan are, are hard to make pencil, even for mission driven financing institutions. And um, that is why you see a lot of CFIs making those micro or nano loans because they have support from the government and from philanthropy to be able to operate at a b- below self-sufficiency, you know, below what the earned income of their interests and loans can provide. Uh, but that can't fill all the gaps. So that's that's one, I think, probably the main thing. And then a lot of the long tail of those micro businesses is sole proprietors. Um, and those are people who might not even have an official DBA. Um, they're filing Schedule C on their tax return and um, they just might not have a full separation between their business and their personal finances. And for any lender, it's just it's hard to untangle that and, and make a credit decision. Um, so I think that is definitely part of it. And it does relate to the to the risk uh, as well. If you look at the survival rate of micro businesses. Yeah. Thank you. We'll take one more question from Zoom and then we'll have to wrap. Okay, up next we have Jason. Uh, Jason, you can unmute yourself. Hi. Yes. Thanks, Matt. Um, you you bring uh, into this work, into this fine report work that you've done all across the country. Um, was there anything in particular that was when you were able to pull all the results together? Was there anything that surprised you in particular uh, about the results? I would, I'll say I was surprised at the lower rate of CDFI lending, just like the absolute dollars out the door from CDFIs to small businesses in, in Fresno County. And I then compared it to the national average, which it, it looks good in the context of, but having gotten to know the organizations in the ecosystem and a lot of the comments on the need if you had asked me what that number was, I probably would have told you 15 million, you know, three times that. So that was kind of the biggest surprise to me. And uh, that's why we kind of broke out the CDFI lending slide and like, what you know, what would it look like if it was significantly higher? Um, right. It came up in every conversation we had um, with TA providers and, and CDFIs alike. So that kind of screams as an opportunity to, to do more. For sure. Yeah, I mean, it, it gets to the it gets to the issue of how um, individual CDFIs and uh, Access Plus is a good example of how making internal investments to be able to frankly scale up, serve more folks. It's it's one of the biggest challenges right now in the field. Absolutely. Good question. Thanks, Jason. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Matt. Thank you all for your questions. I hate to move us along, but we'll definitely share Matt's contact information at the end. Um, Up next, we have a dynamic panel. Um, We have our ecosystem ecosystem leader panel, and we have Jason that will be moderating from Zoom. I just want to introduce our panel um, quickly. I know we'll need to transition a bit um, to get them settled and situated. Um, Sir, First, for our moderator, we have Jason Friedman of Friedman Associates, Penny Garten from CDC Small Business Finance, Dr. Cassandra Little from Fresno Metro Black Chamber of Commerce, Anna Medina from Wells Fargo, and Elliot Belch from Central Valley Community Foundation. Um, As we're speaking about the ecosystem, it takes a lot of different sectors to support small businesses in our community, um, and each have a role. Um, and so we're going to hear about their perspectives. We're going to hear about them reacting to the data and information, and we have some questions. Um, so thank you so much, panelists. We're very excited, and I will turn it over to you, Jason. Thank you. Yes, we do. We have a really great uh, panel to provide us with uh, their feedback and and thoughts about the study and uh, and how it uh, intersects with with their focus on this issue of increasing access to capital in the county. Um, first question, and I just uh, asked folks to to uh, give us uh, no more than a couple minutes uh, answer. But what are the top line takeaways that uh, that struck you? 
from this study that uh, are going to influence your uh, your thinking when you go home? Then we'll start with uh, Penny. <laughs> Uh, oh, let's geez. see. I'll turn on your mic. One moment. I can start with an easier question. Okay. Okay. Are we good? Okay. Can we hear? Oh, we hear. Um, one of the key main takeaways, obviously, is the unmet mm -hmm. columns that we're seeing and how do we reach out to those. And I know a lot of my fellow colleagues here in the room, we're, we all have the same mindset is um the uh the education behind it mm -hmm. we all have the same conversation how do we reach out how do we get in front of these folks how do we get them to come in to have us help them so that unmet page is uh, is a page we need to focus on thank you dr little well, I have a lot of thoughts, but I, you know, I'm one of the, I'm a problem solver. So I look, I, you know, I look at, try to look for solutions. I'm always the why person and how we can do, um, um, how we can do better and what we can do differently. Um, so the unmet part is what stood out for me. Um, and also just knowing that, um, seeing the numbers and just seeing how in relation, seeing the work that needs to be done in Fresno. Um, and knowing that, you know, the ecosystem we do have um, here in Fresno, it just makes me think that we there's a lot more we can do collectively. Um, so I'm thinking of how we're going to collectively get this done. Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Hi, Anna. Hello. Can you hear me? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think for me is, you know, from the observation, my observations is uh, that we need to continue to keep um, preparing businesses for the unexpected. Uh, I think there is a lot to do, you know, when it comes to providing them one-on-one -on -one technical assistance, but really it's like, how do we prepare? Uh, what stood out from that PPP overall lending is businesses were not prepared. So I think it's very important to continue the, the TA for, for the unexpected. Mm -hmm. For sure. Agreed. Hello, Elliot. Hi, Jason. Great to have you all here. Um, uh, yeah, just kind of echoing the other comments. Um, the scale of the challenge is remarkable. Um, and to me, it kind of speaks to, you know, the the dollars that we have that are... Yep. Oh. Um, ooh, it's a lot. Um, the... The scale is remarkable in the context of the sort of the change making tools that we're given, right? So CDFI lending being very small compared to the scale of the challenge. Um, CBCF's total grant making in a year is usually eight to 12 million. So if, uh, so it's similar, similarly sized to those few years ago, CDFI lending. And if we're gonna be, um, you know, I'm speaking from the philanthropy perspective seat is like, if we're going to utilize the resources that we have to change this overall system, we have to be really, um, I think, uh, clever and insightful and strategic about mm -hmm. the kind of the system change investments. We're not going to solve it by just by, um, you know, directly funding loans through CDFIs as the, as the, you know, the sole strategy. Thank you. You know, um, you've, we were, the, the word ecosystem is right there up on the slide and we've used it a lot. And, um, an, an, an ecosystem in, in my mind acknowledges that there are organizations, players, right. Entities that play a role. Um, a system though infers that it's somewhat structured, um, and organized. And I think that we've all through this work and our own work know that, um, that to be able to reach that, uh, even make a dent in that goal, that we, we may have to rethink what that system looks like, what, you know, how we interact with each other, how we partner, et cetera. So I just want to, uh, ask the panel again, and we'll, we'll go, uh, backwards this time. Uh, we'll go with, start with Elliot. Um, you know, we have 
two practitioner organizations here. We have a bank and, and we have a philanthropic organization. So each going to come at this with, with their own perspective. But from the perspective, Elliot, of the foundation, um, what's the call to action? What do you, what do you see as, uh, as kind of initial next steps um, to be able to, uh, to support the, the further development of this system? Yeah, well, and kind of picking up what Anna was saying about, um, you know, folks being prepared to absorb capital, to access capital, um, can mean a lot of different things. There's, um, you know, investments in getting folks' records up to snuff, being ready just directly to apply for a loan. But it really seems to me like um, the notion of being prepared is a, is a broader conversation. Uh, speaks to, you know, there's a, there's an intergenerational, when you see these racial disparities, it's, there's an intergenerational aspect to it. Mm -hmm. There's a contextual and a place-based aspect to it. There's all of these things that affect how, um, you know, families have been able to build wealth um, such that they can be credit worthy or able to access credit. So um, I guess where that leads me to think is that, um, yes, we need to go at the problem directly, but also all of the collective impact work that we're doing in neighborhoods um, to build, you know, more robust economic sectors in our economy, um, to, um, you know, to build, to, to, to build different opportunities in our, in our community, uh, it all hangs together and it all contributes to the solution to this larger problem. Thank you. Hi, Anna. Hello. So, you know, from the from a bank perspective, um, I, I I've been in this role, and I think a lot of you in this room know that I've been in this role for for six months now, and um, I'm very excited. I, I just came back from a whole day of strategic planning um, with my team up in Concord. And I'm very excited, you know, to share with them, you know, kind of all the ex my experiences directly working for a CDFI and out in the community. Um, and, you know, small business growth is a huge, it's a very huge priority focus area for Wells Fargo. Um, internally, I'm also excited to share my knowledge and um you know, educate our business bankers and uh, partners internally about how we can maximize our resources, how we can leverage our resources to get it more out in the community. And I go back to to answer your question, Melinda. Um, you know, we did launch, a, or in part, to answer some one of your your questions that you asked. Beginning of this year, Wells Fargo launched um, what's called the Small Business Navigator Program. Um, and that small best and within that small business navigator program, you have CDFIs and TA providers that are part of that. So when a small business banker goes, a small business walks into the bank, and unfortunately, we you know we can't help them at that point for X reason. Um, we could provide that resource, and that it, within that navigator program, it'll match that business with a local CDFI or a local. Um, TA provider. So I'm really, you know, I'm do, meeting with a lot of the organizations here locally and in other counties, but that's one of the, mm -hmm. one, one thing that I like our local TA providers and CDFIs to be part of, um, just to also be, you know, part of that system. Um, there's, you know, again, going back to that huge priority focus area. There's also opportunities to look at existing businesses already that have an opportunity mm -hmm. to create generational wealth. I'm extremely excited to look to look at innovative ideas within, you know, um, the thing on the philanthropy side of things on how we can make investments towards small businesses that are already operating to own their property, to own their building, and not necessarily in the urban areas, but also in the rural communities. And that's something I'm really excited about. Fantastic. Thank you. Dr. Little. So for us, um, particularly being um, a TA provider and 
you know, leading the Betting Big initiative um, where we have an accelerator that, you know, supposed to do exactly what we are talking about here. And, and right now we're going into our third um, cohort. So we haven't had a problem with gathering the people and getting them in the space to provide them some of the TA um, services that are needed to get them started. But we've, we've identified our own gaps within that program. And it's funny because I think Anna kind of identified it, spoke to it um, when she was part of um, Fresno Drive, and that was we need to we need to put more um, emphasis on the financial um, part of, uh, of of small business with small businesses, because I even asked myself why do businesses need to take a loan? So we need to we kind of need to provide. I, I say we need to do a whole accelerator on what that would do for your business, because that's that's one of the biggest gaps. A lot of our small businesses and entrepreneurs don't see how it benefits them. Um, a lot of them don't have that legacy of or the generations of businesses that have been passed down and knows that know that you don't make money off of your credit card, right? Um, so just kind of providing just, I think we need to just be intentional and just spend a lot of time on that um, with our Betty Big 2.0 that we're going to be, we're looking at next year. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Hi, Penny. Hi. So obviously working for one of the largest CDC CDFIs in the nation, um, we take a lot of this information and, and put it into play. So my team uh, that I work on is smart growth team. And we recognized we needed to add in more bodies to handle the volume that we purely get just from the SBA portal. Um, so we've ramped those up, but one thing I can tell you sitting in the seat with the clients that I've worked with here in the Valley is definitely um, one, like Anna said, the preparedness going after PPP. First thing I heard was, oh, is this a grant? Do I have to repay it? <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> so getting everybody off of that the grant, I don't have to repay it, mm -hmm. took almost this whole year to get them off that stint. Mm -hmm. um, and then getting them into that financial education. And, and one thing I press on my clients every client that I work with, I look at their financials and see who their CPA is. Mm -hmm. And I ask them, do you sit and have a conversation with your CPA when you go to get your tax returns or when you deliver your documents? Mm -hmm. And I will tell you 99% of them say, oh no, I just drop it off or I just pick up. Mm -hmm. That's the key right there. They need to have a financial conversation with their CPAs about their financials and their financial plans. If they're not reaching out to the TA teams, companies all throughout the Valley, then their next best person is obviously their CPA. So the financial education comes into play because that does get them prepared. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it does let them see, Hey, I'm going to grow. I may need to get that loan. How do I get prepared to do that? So there's a lot of starting points, but the biggest one is understanding the financials. Um, you know, when I was in high school, we had a class that taught you how mm -hmm. to do a check, how to balance your checkbook. They don't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. So it, it literally starts at the basics. And if we can start at the basics, which is what a lot of us in the mission driven companies are committed to doing, because that is quite frankly, our mission is to get our clients financially educated and sound mm -hmm. and then prepare them to go to the big banks like Wells Fargo, mm -hmm. you know, Chase, all those to get to that next level lending that has a little bit more palatable rates, programs, you know, different things like that. So okay. for me and our company, we start at the big thing. We really do. Mm -hmm. I was, if I could interrupt Jason, I was going to ask, cause when I, Heard you say, Penny, the phrase, the phrase, when you go to your CPA, and I couldn't help but think about the betting big incubator mm -hmm. and even developing the sense of, of that relationship, mm -hmm. yep. having that person mm -hmm. to call. Yep. They know them by first name. That's yeah. what we make sure. Yeah. And that's key. And, and, and uh, even at my previous company I was at, um, you know, we, we have long time Fresno clients. And I mean, Frank Gallegos, director of St. Cloud, he can tell you, we were both on the same team. We had long time clients that had been with their CPAs for years and never had a set, sit down conversation. And it, some of them, it bit them. It bit them when they came to us for a loan. 
And I can't tell you how many conversations I had pulled to the side after them asking me, Penny, how come our CPA never told us this, Mm -hmm. you know, and I'm not a certified accountant, but I know these are the rules. Mm -hmm. So, um, but yeah, our company stands on, you know, the education. We even have programs that we offer once the client is in there and they're funded, they are given the TA appointments to follow mm-hmm. through, to help them through. Yeah. So it's important. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it takes, it takes time, you know, um, just from a personal experience <laughs> working at, you know, um, on the technical assistance side and video by it takes time and you've got to be patient with that business owner too. Um, you know, just a couple of months ago, I got a call from someone um, that called and said, Hey, I'm ready. You know, I did everything you guys told me to do and I'm ready to come back. And this is, I have three years of tax returns. I talked to that person like more than two years ago. Mm-hmm. Now they're with Ernest. <laughs> I said, what, unfortunately, you know, I can't, I'm no, I'm no longer, um, with access to capital, but congratulations for doing everything that you had mm-hmm. to do to do what you did. And it, it just, it takes time. Mm-hmm. It's going it to take time. Um, the other thing that I, you know, wanted to add is, um, that I think there's also an opportunity to better, I'm not sure if better is the right word, but to define the SBA products externally and internally too, because I spent nine years working at at, at, at CDFI and I still ask my question, ask myself a lot of questions and I, a lot of whys and, you know, and I think there's, there. It, business owners know that SBA exists, but they don't know, you know, spe- the specifics of the programs. But I think internally too, with um, you know, just you know, staff in general is is understanding the details um and why those products are there, um, you know, and how they can help. How how do we maximize them? I mm-hmm. guess is is the thing. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. All right. Well, I think we've uh, we don't want to run over. Are we good on time? Yes, we're good on time. We can actually do one more question. Um, we have until one twenty-five. Yeah, it strikes me one thing we haven't really talked about maybe directly is the relationship between banks and CDFIs. Uh, it was mention of referral uh, relationships and also uh, Matt kind of alluded to, you know, sometimes it's a, the loan coming right out as a square peg in a round hole. So for example, how do, how do we, how do we in, invest uh, the right way to get folks ready in their stage of their business to, to get, uh, to get a loan coming in might mean more patience, might mean some working capital might mean, Mm -hmm. you know, if I'm getting, if I'm talking about real estate, do I have the design ready to loan to of the project? Do I have, you know, do I even know what I'm asking for yet? Um, so I'm just kind of curious, uh, this is, not, I don't know that I would have much of an answer from the CBCF perspective, but just kind of curious about how we're all seeing that CDFI bank relationship mm-hmm. evolving or or not evolving. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I can tell you just from my perspective, because I started my career in the big banks and now I work for a CDC CDFI. So sitting in my seat, Pam and I talk quite a bit. Uh, there's something that plus capital can't do. They reach out to a colleague in the industry and I do the same as well. Um, you know, we are all, uh, trying to do the same thing, which is to help the client. And so we reach out if we can we reach out to others and, and we get them over there. Um, with the banks, it's a little different. Um, I do get referrals from the banks. However, these are folks that have known me in the industry for years Um, one thing I tell a lot of folks is, um, uh, join LinkedIn. (laughs) It is surprising how many connections you will get the emails from, Hey, I've got this kind of client. This is something you can do. Or do you know somebody in the industry who can't, um, it is a very good network. So even if we made a Fresno 
LinkedIn that everybody join all the CDFIs and all the bankers, a community network within Fresno. I mean, I've been thinking about that like the last couple of weeks, really strange. <laughs> mm -hmm. That too, yeah. I mean, Fresno could have one on LinkedIn and then we can all be on there. Um, I get a lot of those questions, you know, hey, who does this, who does that? But I think it comes just from those long-term relationships that we have with bankers. And then like what Anna was saying is the community outreach within their own bank has to occur as well. They have to have that Rolodex that we no longer have on paper that we have on the computer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I, I would add, you know, one thing that I loved and, you know, doing, uh, and this is something that I'm bringing to internally with a, our small business bankers is getting them to, uh, I know with the pandemic, you know, there was no volunteerism going on, or there was not a lot of um, small business bankers out there in the community. But w one thing is we've, we've been talking and as I'm getting to know a lot of them throughout my, my, the two markets that I serve, which is the central Valley and the central coast is partnering with all the CDFIs in those markets to do, um, you know, access to capital workshops where the bank comes in and the CDFI comes in and we educate, you know, the business owners on, you know, how do we work together, mm -hmm. you know, the, what the bank offers, um, because it's constant change. Mm -hmm. I'm learning about new products that we're launching, <laughs> that we're launching and we're being, that are being put together. And then the CDFI, right? So both in the same room, um, talking about what both offer and then how we work together. Um, and I think that's how you start getting to know each other mm -hmm. and getting to know who's who and, mm -hmm. and going back to, cause it's important. It's important. So when you need to make that phone call, Hey, I'm going to send you to Anna, who was at that workshop. So yeah. I think more of those. Yeah. If, if I could ask a question and it, Anna, you kind of set me up for the question that I was going to ask, uh, since we do have, you know, foundation, TA providers, banks, so forth. And then many of you also have experience with uh, CDFIs. Uh, from your perspective, what could we do locally here uh, to support the collaboration be amongst banks, CDFIs and TA providers to better support small businesses? Uh, well, you know, I say expand on what we can do, because I think for with Fresno Metro Black Chamber of Commerce and Access Plus Capital, we, I mean, our relationship is pretty, you know, I mean, we, we do almost everything together. Um, and that's helpful with, for for, our, you know, our particularly the people in our accelerator. We call on you all a lot, but I think we need to expand on that relationship to make it um, where we, I'm not just calling you for one workshop. Um, that it, that your you know your business is integrated into our TA and our 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 you know our members and the, the participants within our accelerators they 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 know who you are they know all the products they it's um, they know how important um, the role that the CDFI play pay plays um, and you know making sure their businesses are going to be successful and sustain um, because for me I think the main issue is that they sustain we, we we've done a great job particularly even during the pandemic, after pandemic, we have a waiting list on our accelerators. We can get businesses started, but right now we're like going back and it's just sustaining and getting people to scale past, you know, just so proprietorship, which that's where we know that's how you create wealth. Um, so I think just expanding on our relationship. And like, I just heard there's 11 CDFIs here. Um, you know, I know I'm new to the Valley. I've only been here three and a half years, but I'm like 11. Um, so part of it is, you know, where are they? Who are they? Um, um, so some of that is on us also to kind of know, you know, who's out there because um, different people have, you know, provide different um, services that can service, you know, um, you know, what we found like with, with some of our, and I, I tell my team all the time is like, you know, we're trauma informed. People walk in differently. They may not work well with Rick one day, but they'll work well with um, Monita. So just knowing that all those CDFIs are out there Mm -hmm. um, having you all in one group and kind of coming and talking to us would be great. Maybe we need to do some kind of get together with all local CDFI bank heads or bank, you know, community leaders, um, kind of like what we used to do a while ago at Wells Fargo. Mm -hmm. We would have a monthly round table on our files of I've got this client who they need this assistance mm -hmm. who can help raise your hand and tell us why. You know, so it all falls on education. 
Mm-hmm. So it's not just educating our clients, but it's also educating all of us within the industry of what you can, like on the back of my hand, I know what Frank's team can do, but that's because I have a great relationship with Frank and mm-hmm. vice versa. So, and just like with you all, I know what you guys can do vice versa. But outside of that, it's just whenever I run into somebody at a mixer or at a meeting or it's like, oh, what are you guys doing? Oh, send that to me. You know, maybe we make it up. I mean, we all belong to chambers. We all meet once a month. How come we can't have something maybe once every other month Mm -hmm. or once a month or something, you know? I think that's great. Mm -hmm. And I've heard it. I'm sorry, because I've just this is like the fourth time I heard the word relationship. And that's critical. I think all around when I talk about ecosystem, the the business and entrepreneur is the center of the ecosystem. And that's how we look at it. Everyone else contributes to the ecosystem. And the one thing that we, you know, we know that relationships are what kind of gets, keeps your business thriving and, um, and going. And so um, I think it's important for um, for us to start in regards to, to c- creating and building those relationships because otherwise you can't really do a soft war- a, a warm what I call a warm handoff if right. you don't know who you're sending people to. So that's why I always go to Access Plus Capital because that's you know that's my warm handoff. Um, so I want to be able to know to you know I want to have a I want to have a list of people I can send our our members to yeah. and our businesses to. I I think one thing that you've done already, it's this, this, I, I, Mm -hmm. you know, for, this is awesome. Mm -hmm. I I, I think, um, you know, I haven't had a chance, but it is something that I will be doing is sharing this, not just, you know, locally with um, the team, but on a national level as well with our, our national leaders within our small business pro focus area. Because I mean, this is this is huge right mm-hmm, here. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so I congratulate you know everyone, all the partners that took part in this, um, because this is great for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and then also I, I think for for myself in my role is just getting to, um, getting to know like what's working and what's not working. Um, just so that I can, you know, take that feedback and, uh, and use it to, to come up with new ideas. We have two more questions in the room and one on Zoom. Mine is more of an ask. Mm -hmm. So we've talked about how much, um, how banks are different. They all have a different focus. Some do startups, some don't. Some look at, um, debt coverage ratios, one to one, one and a quarter, one to five. Mm-hmm. Can the chamber develop a database of that so that they'll know that Wells Fargo would do a startup? Well, mm-hmm. um, somebody would do a projection-based business. So as you're finding out customers that come in, they get turned down at the banks, you want to know why. And it's usually because it doesn't fit their marketing strategy. So find out what that strategy is. And then that way you won't waste their time sending them to a bank that's not going to do it. Okay. I'll be calling you. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. That's a great idea. Yes, it is. Provide an answer like immediately. Fundingfresno.com. Um, so, I mean, part of what Funding Fresno does is actually allow a person to get matched up to a, a CDFI or a lender based on their needs, um, you know, the needs of the business in alignment with uh, the needs of the business and with the, the, that particular lender. And so if you are a startup business, it will align you to a CDFI or alternative lender that does that lending to CDFI. If it's based on a certain kind of general credit criteria, uh, that information is provided. Or if it's, you know, that uh, lender only does, uh, only does, you know, land acquisition, but you know, not working capital, which uh, are are the vi- right, vice versa. Uh, some of that is available too. But the problem with that is that if you don't meet that criteria, there's often mitigants that can get you over the hump. But if you don't know what they, if they don't pick you, they don't get to ask the question. What can you do to offset that? Is there other collateral? Is there a cosigner? Are there projections that we can use instead of historical debt coverage ratios. There are a lot of things that you don't know until you get that relationship with mm-hmm. the lender one-on-one because there's some things that we can do. Yeah. That's 
All right, Sabrina, I saw your hand. That's the benevolent side of the fudge factor. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I think that would also require, you know, some training and um, training for the TA providers um, yeah. to be able to identify some of the things that you mentioned, Dorothy. And I know that um, I know that there's, uh, you know, some of it, some of that that has been provided, but I think it could, there's an opportunity to do more mm -hmm. to to train, and, you know, internally staff and build the capacity. Mm -hmm. It's going to take years in the field to get that. I mean, you can train, but you can't train for every situation. Mm -hmm. So it takes yeah. experience. And that's why I'm saying if you get somebody one on one, you go to that database and then you can expand upon it. Mm -hmm. you're ready to go. I'd be happy to help. Okay. Yeah. So my comment was a little bit um, back down the board, but it was focused more on the relationships with banks and CDFI. So I'm Sabrina Kelly, uh, Vice President of External Relations for Community Division Capital Consultant, Consulting and former philanthropy officer for Wells Fargo. So sitting on both sides of the coin, one of the things that I know is really effective for the bank CDFI relationships is making that donation uh, that is unrestricted capital, because as Matt said, sometimes making the small loans is hard for us to pencil because making mm -hmm. a $500,000 loan is just as costly as making a $5 million loan. So that's one option. The other option is for banks to consider making both a donation and an investment. So donating EQ2s, for example, could help us move the needle providing patient affordable capital in communities like Fresno that are high concentrations of poverty, high, gen high micro businesses, single sole, sole entrepreneur businesses. And the other thing is that um, subject matter culturally centered uh, expertise, boots on the ground type of approach. Um, they used to have real estate. We, we used to have a real estate development officer. They got um, scooped up by by the foundation, oh, by Elliot. So we're looking for somebody, shameless plug, if you <laughs> want to do some, some meaningful work in the community. But I think all of those approaches, donating funding mm -hmm. and donating uh, investment funds, and then for banks to lend their subject matter expertise to volunteer to work on some of this collaboration and um, and and think iter iter iteratively about the, the process. And it is going to take a lot of conversations, mm -hmm. a lot of planning, but I think it can be done. So thanks. Thank you. I have two questions on Zoom, and then we'll wrap this segment. Uh, the question is from uh, Jensen. You can uh, unmute. Yeah, this is a question for the panel. Uh, Jensen Vang, I'm here at the, uh, the front, uh, representative from the center. Um, is there a way? Um, I like Penny's comment earlier about the whole TA and education thing, but I think it's also very important that um, I mean, there's enough data set from the report and and from I think the Valley and some of our CBLs here in attendee the vice versa uh, that could see some of this. And I think you know, my question is for the panel is that um, is there a way, um, knowing the disparity uh, data set that we're seeing, and you know it seems to be a continuation. So my question is, is there a way uh, where we, as in like the bank, lender, CBOs, those involved in finance, you could, could somewhat categorize um, these businesses and create low products. And I think the comment Matt mentioned earlier is like the trucking product of uh, the trucking loan works for like the trucking industry. Um, and so could, could this group create or uh, a loan or come together and identify industries based off of, you know, ethnic and race and, you know, create those loan products. And I, and I say that, I, I think it's, I say that because, um, you know, having worked in the community in general, I can see that different uh, ethnic or minority group uh, tends to uh, develop certain type of business like food or ag or like certain areas. So uh, I would be open to that dialogue or I would also be open to just kind of hearing some feedback because I, as long as, and I don't think those products are are not tailored enough to to different group. And that's the the gap that I see that, that could potentially close this gap. Um, I'll pause there and uh, just kind of interested to see if, if there's a way for for all of us to to really categorize so the industry because um, I think there are strengths in those community and what they're doing. Um, like value food added is definitely a 
a big area <clears throat> that is growing like an API population. The, the question is, are there loan products that are targeting so they can enhance and grow those unit productions and, and start a manufacturing company? Myself, personally, I do see a huge growth. And now the question is, do we have loan products? So that's kind of like the forward thinking approach that I'm, I'm looking here and seeing how this group here uh, could potentially address as a way to, to grow uh, more small businesses in Valley. Well, maybe the comment I would make is um, not necessarily to answer like, you know, we need this loan product in this market right now. But uh, the essence of the question is is why we help sort of organize and get funding for funding Fresno uh, going back a few years was really the, the fact that um, there needed to be more of a two-way relationship and conversation, both uh, different ways to get the opportunity for community lending capital out there in ways that would actually reach people and through trusted relationships on the ground. And then also to, to be hearing back from the community through those different channels about what, un, what the, what the specifics of the unmet needs look like. And so, um, you know, that, that implies that the coalition of funding Fresno is continuing to remain together and is, is, is collaborating and is sharing. I guess my other comment is ultimately kind of back to this banker discussion. Um, you know, everybody's a navigator and we're all, um, whichever door somebody comes in, we should all be trying to, um, uh, ensure that the people who are opening that door know where else people can go to find the services that are the best fit for them. Mm -hmm. um, and probably more often than not, there's a product out there mm -hmm. uh, that somebody could find their way to. Yeah, I second that. Our, uh, my company specifically, we do have a, a product that is called Impact Lending, and it focuses on African-American, Hispanic, and LMI zone. Those are the three main areas. So for example, you could have a business owner who lives in Clovis, but their business door storefront is in an LMI zone. They qualify. So it is possible to do. It's just some lenders have to have the capability and the fundraising in order to have those loans. So um, that's, that's another category. My company is a nonprofit. So we obviously have a team that, you know, we have state funds, federal funds, investment, all of that, so. And within this, the small business navigator portal that Wells Fargo launched, it, it, it also uh, includes, you know, a list of everyone that is participating within that portal. Um, and it does list out, you know, what their focus is, what, you know, kind of their lending capacity is and gives a description of the CDFI or the TA lender. So that, I think that would also be a good resource. All right. Thank you. We are a bit over time, but we have one more segment. Well, we can still continue the chat. I'm just doing a time check. It's 1.33. We're wrapping at two. And our next segment is actually breakout. So you'll get to um, chat with a partner. We'll come back, make some um, wrap up remarks. And that will be led by our president of Access Plus Capital, Tate Hill. Um, so I will, one, before I move too fast, thank you, panel. Let's give our panelists a warm welcome. Sounds like some great discussions happening. We'll bring it back together to close out the convening. I'm going to turn it over to Tate Hill to um, close out any final comments, any last comments from the floor and next steps. Well, we want to thank everyone for participating with us on today. Um, you know, as we started this uh, project, you know, the thing that we asked for was, what if we had the data that would show the demand? You know, what, what would happen if we had the data, um, you know, as we were engaging around funding, uh, funding Fresno and uh, the Fresno Drive Initiative? The big question is, well, how do we prove that there's a demand for 
CDFR or alternative or impact uh, lending? Well, we have it today. Three, $3 billion unmet need, over $1.3 billion of application-based uh, demand that's there. So we, we know that the, the demand is there. And I think what we saw today is that that demand requires collaboration and an ecosystem to help build capacity. That was a number of the things that folks on the panel said, that Matt shared, others that uh, commented today. Also, that there is an opportunity to expand capital access in LMI BOP, uh, and uh, BIPOC uh, businesses. There's an opportunity to be able to, to scale up in some of these communities. There's a huge opportunity around uh, micro businesses. And then, uh, you know, there was the comment about uh, there are 11 CDFIs that operate in some form or fashion here in Fresno County. Uh, and we were talking in our group, uh, some of those may be statewide or national in scope, but how do we bring them into uh, the fold? Uh, one of the numbers that uh, Matt shared that I thought was really important, um, uh, just talking about opportunity, like how do we think about the opportunity of where we were in 2017 at 5 million? And I think I would believe in, uh, that those numbers uh, have increased uh, even towards uh, 2021. Uh, but how do we begin to think about over the next couple of years that scaling up to that 5% of, of lending up to that 38 million or even an incremental steps towards that? Um, you know, how do we think of getting even up to $20 million, right? And, and getting up to the, the 38. Uh, but for just for an example, you know, uh, the 20 million over five years, that's a hundred million dollar goal. Right. And sometimes it's just easier to think of, yes, can we do a hundred million dollars? Well, through Fresno Drive, that was part of the concept. Could we expand lending by a hundred million dollars to underinvested communities, that concept? And so I would say, as we have foundations and banks and others here today, how do you help us do that expansion? How do you help uh, help uh, scale CDFI, CDCs, and other lenders to be able to do that? And that kind of leads kind of to the last question or last comment that I heard from everyone: uh, the importance of increasing the small business ecosystem, both in capital and operational capacity. Right. So it's not just the dollars for the lending, but what is also the operational capacity, and that's integrated services, that's regular engagement. That's marketing and uh, uh, capacity, and also the kind of capital that will allow those CDFIs and other uh, lenders uh, to provide uh, the loans that are flexible and meet the need of the businesses where they are. So we want to encourage you to uh, continue supporting the work of funding Fresno. It's something for all of us. Um, is not owned by any one particular entity, um, but uh, really appreciate everyone being here on today. Uh, we look forward to us all working together in 2023 um, as you're closing out this year and probably frantically getting those last loans or TA or reports or whatever uh, done at the end of this year. You know, if you if you're if you're trying to get out any last grants, I'm sure there's a number of CDFIs and CDCs that will raise their hand and uh, and take that, you know, those last end of the year dollars also. Uh, but uh, we want to encourage you to stay engaged. Uh, we hopefully that we'll be able to you'll be able to as an organization use this as you're engaging, uh, you know, your stakeholders and say, okay, how do we collectively, how does our individual organization, but how do we also collectively as a small business ecosystem uh, increase access to capital for our community? Again, just want to thank uh, the Central Valley Community Foundation for hosting us on today. Want to thank the small business uh, that we use for our lunch. What is the, the name of the business? I. PS Productions uh, uh, and uh, uh, supporting, uh, providing a great lunch on today. And also want to say thank you to uh, CMAC 
And so we'll be providing you information about how you can share this. So not just for the folks that were here today, but we'll be able to share that to your stakeholders, put it on your social media, on your website and so forth. And also, I just want to thank all the staff that helped uh, from the various organizations, from Access Plus, from Central Valley Community uh, Foundation and others that helped to make this uh, happen. Big shout out to uh, Sherella Nicholson, Jan uh, Janelle, uh, Warren Evans, um, Terry, who made sure you could get inside uh, the building. Uh, <laughs> there she is, see, right there. Uh, make sure you can get in inside uh, to Taylor and others. And so again, just thank you and um, have a good afternoon. <laughs>